Okay. Um, thanks everyone for being here, and thanks to the ABC, ABC team for helping to plan this conference and bring it on in what a beautiful place, Kruger. We're all really excited to be here. Today I'm going to be talking about a chapter of my PhD concerning the effect of group composition on signature works of production and detection and those implications for population models, such as a market capture or spatial capture capture. So just a little background, uh, signature whistle is an individual signal stable over time that's developed soon after birth. It's a cohesion call, but because of these uh, thought dependent and behaviorally dependent on when they produce it. So what various studies have found that it could be anywhere between 38 and 7% of the repertoire of free-ranging dolphins. Uh, my study population is the resident population of Kamabano's dolphins in Libya. And we've been working there for over 10 years now, so we've got a breadth of background knowledge, uh, a catalog of about 80 signature whistle types. We know that they're very coastal species and much of their distribution, as well as the sex, age, social networks, and relatedness of a portion of the population. Um, you can see two examples. Skipping ahead like that, but we'll manage. Two examples of the signature whistle types uh, from this population. So, just a little bit of the previous work that's been done. Uh, back in 2014, Anna Kressel published a paper using uh, boat based focal follows. And in that, she found that clearly um, in larger groups, you're going to get a higher diversity or more signature whistle types. But more interestingly, um, and biologically, it makes a lot of sense. The calf present has a strong effect on the number of whistle types seen. So there's more calves, we get more signature whistle types. This is because oftentimes other calf pairs will produce those whistles, they're always producing those whistles to stay in contact with each other. Our goal in my project in PhD is to study, to move away from both based focal follows and to use static long term hydrophones um, to record and, you know, and use these signature whistles to, as uh, individual identifiers. So just a brief project overview. Um, Sasha's also, Sasha and me are part of this sort team. Signature whistles for occurrence, recapture intensity, an acronym that I know I'm really proud of. Thanks, Tess. Um, so SWORD is a cost-effective long-term monitoring framework which uses individually distinct acoustic labels. Currently, we're developing it with two different dolphin species, but it does have the potential to be used in any species, terrestrial or marine, that has a unique acoustic label stable over time. Uh, one issue that I'll be looking at and talking about today is that the vocal production of these signature whistles can be very contextually dependent and uh, based on group composition or the behaviors of the group that's recording. And so in this study, I used congruent photographic and acoustic data to try and tease some of those nuances apart. So basically, are the individuals available for detection? You can see a photo of where this study was taking place um, a hydrophone in the shallow water lagoon in Namibia, in Washington, Namibia, um, which is often frequented by the population of populous dolphins. So are the ones that are making the noises or the natural representation of the signature whistles, the natural representation of the ones available for detection? So for this study, I had 15 days, um, which turned into 13 usable days based on the lack of data in two of usable encounters where we had both acoustic data and photographic data. From the acoustic recordings, I was able to identify 30 individual signature whistle types. And from the photographic data, we identified 33 individuals. And with that photographic data, we were able to know the group size of that encounter, as well as the age classes that were present. You know the sex for over 90% of the individuals in those encounters, as well as the I saw the digital change. Um, the association levels measured as a half weight index for population, which is done with multiple years of data, photographic data. And you can also see in the top right map the hydrophone of that red dot. Our office is blue dot to the north, and our residence is just south, south, south east of that. So when these dolphins do enter the lagoon, it's an ideal location to run out and take photographs, and then they use that lagoon for hours at a time, socializing, often feeding producing these signature whistle types. So I ran a few analyses, which I'll give some 
preliminary results to in this study. Um, the, I was using GLM models to the few response variables. One was the number of signature whistles, as well as the number of signature whistle types or individuals identified. And then I ran some simple market capture models with the detectability over these capture occasions. And then the third analysis was looking at the, act the actual production rate of signature whistles within each individual. Um, to investigate the group, how group composition has an effect on that, I looked at the group size, which is the count, the age classes of the individuals present, the sex, which I was using a female or male ratio as opposed to a count, I found it worked a little bit better, and then association levels measured at a halfway index. And then because those so each halfway indexes are between individuals, I calculated a weighted mean of the individuals within each encounter. Uh, so I don't like tables because they're hard to read, <laughs> but I just wanted to highlight that one of the joys of working with wild dolphins is that you get a very few number of usable encounters. And they're all great encounters, but it makes modeling somewhat difficult, and especially when you have over 10 different coefficients you're trying to kind of tease out and look at. So that's just what I'll point out here. Numbers don't matter. Don't use tables. Um, again, the numbers in this uh, don't really focus on, except for you can see on the right one. So this is just a, I ran a theorem rank coefficients correlation between all my coefficients. And I found that many of them were very insignificant. Um, and that's a product of just having 13 days of data or a sample size of 13. So instead of using that golden 95% significance, I'm just going to lower my significance to around 80% and try and look at the more biologically relevant answers that we can find. Additionally, as opposed to modeling all your coefficients in one, as one, I'm using these full models where don't worry about these numbers, these models will change. But you can see on the bottom, so the x-axis is uh, the, all the coefficients, on the right is the number of process types identified. It's going to be an increasing slope because with group size and more males and more females, you're clearly going to get more whistle types. However, doing that is kind of like counting dolphins with multiple individuals in a way in a search zone, which is, it doesn't really work out very well. So what I started to try and do is use categorical models, one of which would be a sex model, so just simplify it, you can see more precise interactions. This result is somewhat interesting in that the, if there were more males present, we actually identified more whistle types, which biologically, in previous work, I believe, and also work in Namibia, we have these four individuals, which are always together, it's four males, we call them the Ninja Turtles, they all have those names. Um, and they're consistently hanging out together. When we record them, they're always silent. So they're four highly associated males that never produce whistles. Compared to if you have <coughs> mother calf groups, or in this, the other uh, category of model we use, the age model, you can see, so this says, uh, a sub, if you have sub-adults, lots of sub-adults, this result is highly significant, you're going to get more whistle types. So it's basically, Chatty youngsters are always going to produce a whistle type and have more of a need to convey their identity within the group. Uh, as well as mother calf pairs, you know, they always produce their signature whistles because they need to sing those together. Uh, I think in this result, the calves and the adults didn't produce as high, didn't have as much of a weight on the number of whistle types identified, possibly because in these larger groups, you're only going to ever have maybe one or two mother calf pairs, so the weight of that in terms of the count of signature whistle types you receive will be artificially screened lower. Uh, the next analysis I want to present is just looking at, so I used uh, just a format Charlie Saver, so a mar simple market capture model to compare the acoustic data, which is in red, as well as and then the photographic data in blue. So this is a plot just of detectability, uh, not survival or abundance or anything. And you can see over the 13 capture occasions, the detectability for each occasion was fairly similar. Um, eventually, I want to try and start including within each occasion, and add kind of the group composition and see how those effects play out in terms of detectability. Which is future work, hopefully, complete soon.
My final analysis is looking at production rates, not just how many crystal types we identify, how often you, uh, they're repeated. There's also the implications for like, with these fast moving groups, would you catch all the whistle types as they're moving on the coast at seven to 10 kilometers? With this, in a shallow coastal habitat where the detection range is, can be as little as 650 meters to a kilometer, which is uh, what I found in my last publication. But you can see here the top line, uh, the top row is the half weight index. So, you, you, uh, and because it's on the left side of zero, which is where the blue lines start, you can see that in highly associated groups, they do not produce their whistle types as rapidly uh, as in lesser associated groups. Additionally, the third, line, third row down, which is group size, um, again, we know you get more whistle types in higher group size, that seems fairly, that makes sense. But they're also producing them at a faster rate. This could be because in large groups with lots of whistle types being produced, there's a need for each individual to produce those produce theirs four times and faster in order to be heard and you know, facilitate that cohesion. Uh, and that brings me to my conclusion. So with effective modeling, uh, especially when you have a group, effective modeling is necessary, especially when you have a very limited data set. Um, I've been thinking about adding both base data to try and really understand the effects of room composition, but we're trying to stay away from doing that and staying with these long-term passive acoustic uh, Morons. Additionally, we believe that cat presence, association levels, and sex should affect production rates and detectability. However, over time, results will be comparable to photo ID. So, understanding the nuances, but uh, it's important. But we also believe that it would be a very effective method to use signature whistles in market capture and facial capture capture. I did deploy six hydrophones over three months along the 400 or so kilometers of the Namibian coast last year. And I'm really excited to get into that data and we can start looking at density patterns and movement patterns. That's um, where the fun begins. <clears throat> Finally, so uh, as I just, I just said, production rate of signature whistles increases with increased association levels, but also, also increases with group size. And with that, I would like to thank you and the rest of my team and funders.